Welcome to Still Unbelievable, a podcast by Reason Press, where we examine religious claims, especially those made by Christians, and we regularly respond to items that are featured on the podcast, Unbelievable. We embrace dialogue, but as sceptical former believers, we will also criticise unfounded claims and unsupported beliefs. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Still Unbelievable. This is your regular host Matthew. I am without Andrew this week because Darren is joining me as special guest host. Those of you who listen to my podcast will know that Darren is a regular guest at the moment. He's taking a very active part in our Analyzing the Alpha course series. So this is going to be a voice that you're very familiar with. Just as a keynote, just in case anyone notices anything different, I have bought a new microphone this is the first time I'm using it and testing it. So if there's any difference in sound quality, blame the microphone. I'm hoping it will make my editing easier. I guess I'll find out as the weekend progresses and uh, I start editing this. So as a special guest we've got for ourselves, for Darren and myself to talk to, is Paul Downs QC. Now, Paul is a barrister or lawyer, if you prefer, here in the UK. And he is founder of a group called Genexis UK. Now, the reason why I have invited Paul on to talk to us for an episode and the reason why Darren is joining me instead of Andrew is Genexis are doing a series of Zoom courses. I don't know if courses are quite the right word. Paul will correct me in a minute. We've done them for two weeks and I think we've got another five weeks, of course. So seven weeks in total examining different aspects of evidences for Christianity, both from philosophy and for science, and inviting people to be challenged about what Christianity claims and to see how they feel about it at the end of it. So those of you who are listening to this podcast and listening to our Alpha analysis series, Genexus is different to Alpha. It focuses on on very different things. And my personal opinion is it goes into much more technical detail than Alpha does. And I'm actually appreciating Genexus for that. So with me having said that, Paul, welcome to Still Unbelievable. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Nice to be with you. To correct anything that I might have incorrectly said, tell us a little bit about Genexis, a little bit about yourself, why you founded Genexis and what the aims of Genexis is. Yeah, Genexis is a programme of presentations aimed at better informing people, the public, about the arguments for theism. I wouldn't say it's a sort of an argument for theism, but presenting evidence for theism, allowing people to make up their own mind, obviously, uh, at the end of that. I think that a lot of the public debate or view about the big question, is there a God, is ill-informed, and people don't appreciate either the evidence, the existence of evidence, or the consequences of a purely atheistic worldview. And so I feel that I want to plug that gap, uh, do my little bit. And so a couple of years ago, we set up this project. Uh, It started last year with presentations at Coventry Cathedral. We got certain names I'm sure will be very familiar to uh, you to speak on different simple aspects of the theistic, atheistic debate. Uh, We packed Coventry cathedrals and the 1,000 people a night in. We've not been able to do it this year for obvious reasons. So one of the other spin-offs that we've done is this Zoom course of a series of sessions, again, coming at these key topics from different angle, uh, slightly more interactive. And we aim to continue. So we've got plans for next year to do two events, one in London, one in Coventry again. Thank you. And it's quite a challenge um, because when I did Alpha earlier in the year, at the beginning of lockdown, it was literally a group of about a dozen of us. It was very easy Zoom call to manage. And we we chatted together and it was in the same Zoom session. With what you're doing with the Genexus Zoom is it's on a much, much bigger scale. I don't know how many were on there Monday just gone. It was but it was, at the last count that I saw, it was well over 70 people on it. I'm sure it went up uh, beyond that. Uh, and then you're breaking us off into small groups and then bring us back again. So there's quite a lot of technicalities to manage there. I think I logged on about 15 minutes uh, before it was due to store and you were there managing various people with the technical issues they were having and uh, 
doing a job that was good enough that I would probably consider you as our help desk person at the job that I do. And listeners know that I work in IT, but I'm sure it's not a job that you would want uh, full time. Well, and, I'll, uh, bear, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the practice... Uh, implodes at any point I might give you a call <laughs> I certainly didn't didn't envy that so managing a really big zoom call like that must be quite a technical challenge but I'm really glad that we've got technology uh, to do that so from the technical perspective and the responses to the format that you've got because it's obviously very different to how you did it last year do you have any thoughts on on how that went and is it a format that you would be tempted to carry on with when we're allowed to actually see each other in the, in real life yeah we definitely will have the annual at least annual event and the vision is that it will be uk based for the next year and then we'd want to do it internationally after that take it to the states and the far east so that's the vision yeah and that will be zoom as well as a uh, physical presentation no that that would be a a live physical meeting That'll be a, um, okay. but the course idea is something that we do want to develop separately and in parallel but the main focus will be these hopefully large-scale conferences i think it's worked quite well with alpha i think they've been very pleased with the response of it and i think they probably intend to do something like that as well and i am only attending your genexus because it's online and convenient so it wouldn't be convenient for me to go to london to to visit so You've only reached me because of that. And well, I'll see if I can tempt you down next year, Matthew. I'll buy you a beer afterwards. I, I, I'm, if it's for a beer, I'm, I'm sure I can do it. It's so rare that I get into London, genuinely, uh, but I, I'm sure we can create a special environment for it. Uh, and, and it will be really great to, to meet you in person. Uh, I managed to interview... Steve Chalk in January at the beginning of the year and I know he was due to come over to my side of the country and I was trying to make arrangements to go and meet him and then of course lockdown happened and that that killed all those ideas so absolutely it would be great to do that so let's hope that that does happen. So you did the first presentation of the Genexus actually before we jump into that I just wanted to throw in I've been onto your Genexus website do you want to just tell everybody what the URL, URL is for Genexus? Yes, thank you. It's www.genexis.org. And I've been onto that website and I've seen some of the photos from last year's event and I can see you've got quite a few videos from last year's lectures. I've not yet got round to watching any of them. I, I probably will, but I'm focusing on the course that you're doing now for, for the next few weeks. But I will definitely make the time to go and watch those videos. So curious listeners, they can go and do those. Do you know if the content from any of this year's Zoom course is going to be made into videos or have you just not planned that? We haven't taken a view on that at, at okay. the moment. Uh, it's a good question. But at the, at the moment, we're we're just keeping that to the people on the course. OK, fair enough. So you did the opening lecture, which was two weeks ago now, and uh, you did a presentation there. And part of that presentation involved a, a discussion on evidence. So could you... Um, Give us a bit of a, a cut down uh, uh, version of, of what you said, how you define evidence, and we'll probably jump in with a, with a couple of questions and see where the conversation goes from there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I come at the, the issue of evidence from a lawyer's perspective, which is different, I think, sometimes at least from scientific uh, aspect. But for me, evidence, it's simply identifying known facts for the purpose of ascertaining other unknown facts. So evidence in a courtroom are core facts that can be established with certainty. And then from those facts, one draws inferences, uh, depending on whether they are fair, uh, balanced and the like. So the simplest example is, say there's a dispute. I had a case once, a dispute about whether there was a contract in a wine bar. It was an oral contract. There was no writing. It was just done on a handshake. One side said there was a contract. The other side said there wasn't. Now, frequently, clients will say to me, we've got this dispute, and we say this. The other side say that. It's our word against theirs. There's no evidence. There's no evidence. But in fact, what somebody says in the witness box is evidence. So if somebody goes in the witness box and says, I was in the wine bar on such and such date and we had this conversation and at the end of the conversation we shook hands and there was a contract. Now, 
um, the evidence is that person saying it in the witness box. That is that that's the fact that nobody can dispute. Nobody can dispute that Mr. Smith went into the witness box, swore an oath and said that that's the evidence. Now, the question then becomes, can you infer from that fact that what they say is correct? That's the next stage in the process. And then you bring into um, bear other things like, does it fit with the contemporaneous documents uh, insofar as they exist? Does the person appear truthful? Are they a good character? All the rest of it. And then you, you, you draw inferences and then you might draw other inferences and other inferences. And at the end, you reach a conclusion. But the evidence are those core facts, the starting point that nobody can dispute. That's my approach. So the big question, is there a God? Why am I here? What's the purpose of everything? What are the core facts that I admit? Now, I do accept that some of the things that I rely upon, others will say, well, you can't take that as evidence because, for example, that is just a construct of your subjective state of mind. I accept there's a huge debate to be had about that. But for me, my personal reasoning I say I choose the evidence, I decide what evidence is admissible, just as you would in a courtroom. And then once I've gathered that body of evidence together, I draw the inferences from it that I think are fair. I think the other thing I've said, which is important, I think, in this context, it's to distinguish between deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is the sort of reasoning that one uses in a courtroom or a historian would use it in weighing up primary evidence and working out what happened years ago. That's a logical process. I see A, I see B, and therefore I can deduce C. And the example I gave of that sort of logic, one plus one is two, two plus two is four, therefore one plus one plus one plus one equals four. Simple example. Mm -hmm. Premise, sub-premise, conclusion. That's called a syllogism. If the logic works, um, my uh, all dogs are animals. Fido is a dog. Therefore, Fido is an animal. That's deductive reasoning. The scientific method, if I can use the expression from Isaac Newton, it doesn't work on deductive reasoning. It works on inductive reasoning. It works by hypothesis and then repeatable experimentation on the control conditions from which inferences are drawn. And sometimes I think there's a, in the language of this debate, there's a confusion between the two. And people talk about evidence as being, as in a scientific sense, you know, experimental results. Personally, I don't think that these big questions are susceptible to the scientific process because you can't devise repeatable experiments. One's left drawing inferences from other evidence in a deductive fashion, working out what is the most parsimonious explanation for what you see before you. In a nutshell, that's what I was saying. On the subject of the scientific method that you mentioned and testing things scientifically, you said something along the lines of some of these things, presumably referring to Christianity, can't be tested in the scientific way because there isn't a repeatable test to be done. Is there anything specific that you've got in mind that, that meets that? One example that I spoke about briefly is the multiverse. The multiverse is a hypothesis that can't be proven. We can't prove, certainly not the multiverse when we're talking about a multiverse that is an answer to the fine tuning argument. It's philosophically impossible because it lies outside of this universe by definition. Um, I suppose another example would be the question, where do the laws of physics come from? It's an imponderable uh, we, we, we can't establish that by experimentation because the scientific method ends with the laws of physics, can't go beyond them. Once you get to these, I mean, I, I suppose that I listened to your episode on the resurrection, which I thought was very interesting. Is that but, the one with Jonathan McClatchy? Yes, I think it was. Yeah. yeah. And it was interesting because and it made me think quite a bit about the philosophical gap between the sceptic and the, the believer and the philosophical gap is, for the sceptic, it is just impossible. It is a physical impossibility for somebody to be raised from the dead, which is, of course, true in the natural. 
But for the believer, they say, well, yes, but I, I don't accept that the natural world is all there is to understand about the evidence. And therein, there's the sort of fundamental imponderable. You can't bridge that. You can't reason your way through it or find a, a solution mathematically or scientifically. It's just simply two very different worldviews. And neither can be proven or disproven. Well, if something can't be proven, though, then shouldn't people reserve their belief in it? Well, there you see now you're, this is the burden of proof difficulty and Bertram Russell's teapot and the like. But, but that logically doesn't work when you're addressing a fundamental binary point, a yes or no question. I've just tossed a coin. Is it heads or tails? I say to you, I believe it's heads. And you say, well... You've got to prove that. You've got to come up with the evidence. Right. And then the evidence for that would just be pointing to the coin that's already landed, right? The point I'm trying to make is that in order to establish a default position, because the burden of proof takes a, assumes there's a default position, uh, innocent till proven guilty, that sort of thing, you have to establish the default position. You can't just claim it and assert it. You have to establish it. So you can either establish it from the inherent probabilities or you could establish it from public policy. That's I mean, innocent till proven guilty. That's driven by both. If you're dealing with something on a fresh basis and it's either A or B, where's the inherent probability in that? You can't admit evidence. The, the inherent probability starts before there's any evidence. In order to have the burden of proof, what you're saying is without any evidence, the default position is X. Well, in order to claim that default position, you have to show something inherent about your proposition that makes it more probable than not. And, the, well, and, we, and these don't, because these boil down to binary imponderables. Well, if my claim is that fairies exist, then the default position on that, since no one's ever seen or touched a fairy, would be that no one knows whether fairies exist or not, right? But the existence so if, of fairies isn't, isn't the same. I mean, here we're dealing with a philosophical choice between no cause or an external cause. That's well, except we're not, right? That's not the position of the people that are claiming a God. They don't say God has no cause or he has an external cause. He, they also say that he also has, his cause is self-sufficient or something like that. No, so it's an uncaused cause. The theists, the theist asserts an uncaused cause. Right, but, That's the, whole but point. the existence of God is not, I mean, you, you don't, the theist doesn't sit down and say, they will say this for the universe, but they don't actually say it for a God. They don't say, well, the options is, is God has no cause or he has an external cause. They just say he's necessary and that uh, he can't not exist, no. so they try to bypass the whole... No, no, thing. No, you could say the same thing about the universe, about the quantum foam that created the universe. You could just say it's necessary and you don't even need a God at that point. And when we've got scientific evidence for a quantum foam through the math that we've derived from what we've observed, that at least gives it a possibility. No, Whereas no, if you're presenting a God, then you don't actually have any evidence for a God. You're just proposing a hypothesis for a God because you don't think the natural world can do what you're claiming it can't do. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does. I mean, it's, a, it, it's the philosophical conundrum. Each side of the debate has to grapple with a problem of infinite regression. Quantum foam doesn't get you anywhere. It just gets you one step down the line. David Albert points well, this out. Well, God doesn't solve that problem either. There's the imponderable. The choice is between infinite regression and you can never, in a purely naturalistic analysis you, you will never reach the end you can never because well, that's asserting quantum phone doesn't help because where does the quantum phone come from well just asserting a god doesn't help either because where does god no, no, come from but you, you <laughs> so, hang on a minute. i'm not the one claiming the burden of proof i'm not saying you have to believe in god unless you can prove your atheism that's not my perspective so well, I'm, I'm not saying you have to floor I'm not trying to prove well, I'm not trying to prove quantum foam. I'm just offering that up as a mathematical deduction that scientists have come up with that's actually deduced from the math that we have shown to be accurate about the universe. Let me ask you then, where does the quantum foam come from? Where do the laws of physics come from? 
why does it have to come from anywhere? If God doesn't have to come from anywhere, then why does the quantum foam have to come from anywhere? So are you saying that there is no beginning? That the laws of the universe have always been there? I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a possibility. Of course it's a possibility, but we've got to decide what, where the burden of proof lies. And for you to assert that the absence of a God, in inverted commas, is inherently more probable. You've got to tell me something that makes it inherently more probable. And you haven't. Well, I have. We have. Well, you haven't. You just asserted quantum foam, but you can't tell me a where I haven't, it came I from. haven't just asserted quantum foam. You keep saying that, but I haven't just asserted quantum foam. Quantum foam is a direct de deduction from the math that we have shown to be accurate about the universe. It's not just something someone made up. It actually comes out of the math of mm -hmm. relativity and some of these other mathematical constructs that we've created that describe the universe as we know it. Quantum physics is a very well established piece of the universe. I'm it's not the math that. It has been demonstrated to be accurate. And if you take it seriously, you get quantum foam out of that. But I'm not so doubting it, that. You're, you're, so you're, it, it, I'm not just making up a quantum foam. I'm actually presenting a, a real possibility from the deductions made by the math that we have shown to be accurate. Whereas you can't do that with God. You're not addressing the philosophical problem that you need to address. Just by well, asserting I, quantum foam, it's not meeting my point. Well, just well, asserting that there's a philosophical problem doesn't mean that it actually exists. <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to explain what I'm getting at. There is a binary choice. However you construct it, you will always be left with this conundrum, which is a choice between no cause, no external cause, or just a purely naturalistic process. And... The atheist, however far back the atheist goes, the question will always be, well, well what caused that? And there, there has to come a point when the science and the maths runs out because you can never use science and maths to go beyond our universe. It, well, yeah, it, but making up a God doesn't help with that. But, but just, 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 pa just, pause. <laughs> just pause. I'm not the one saying I've got the burden of proof on my side. You're the one, Darren, saying you've got the burden of proof. So I'm not no, saying... If you're, if you're not, presenting a God, you have a burden of proof. No, but you're just asserting that. Why? Why is it inherently more if probable that there's no... No, explain this. Why is it inherently more probable that there is no God than there is a God? Because no one has presented any evidence that the supernatural You're just exists. asserting the burden of proof again. All you're doing is saying, okay, I, the I burden of hate proof is Christian on my Stevens. side because the burden of proof is on my side. Tell okay. me why it's inherently more probable that there's because no Because you cannot provide any reason to believe that a God actually exists. Just asserting the burden of proof again. Okay, can I try and uh, jump in here and take it on a different angle? I, I get what you're saying, you're both saying, and it'll be interesting to unpack that more. But I, I just want to try and take it on a different angle and, and rewind a, a couple of steps. You mentioned, Paul, earlier the, the difficulty of the infinite regress. And I accept that there's a challenge there with infinite regress. I think there's a point there where the infinite regress chain gets broken, and, I th and that's at uh, the point of time, because time as we experience it is inherently a property of the matter of the universe within which we exist. So everything that we know, everything that we love, everything that we experience is dependent on this relentless forward stepping of time and time only marches in that one direction so we have this linear progression of, of things and some things happen before other things and things are caused by things that happened before them but this gets really complex and really difficult when we get to post big bang or post uh, inflation whichever model you want to talk about and when we get beyond that time as we know it, as we experience it, as we love it within our universe, ceases to exist. So it seems to me that trying to talk in terms of causes to that point where there is no time creates such a challenge that we're probably actually incapable of doing it. And the idea that there could be things that cause themselves in a place where there is no time kind of makes sense to me. 
and I, and I hope my my crude way of explaining this makes sense. So, do you think, Paul, that that is sufficient to break any kind of infinite regress that we might have from a materialistic point of view? I agree that time is a massive challenge because, as you quite rightly say, what caused the Big Bang? Well, or what was before the Big Bang? Well, <laughs> hang on a minute. <laughs> there is no before the Big Bang because that's when time, as we experience it and know it, started. That's um, not actually... So now you're correcting me, Darren. Okay. Can well, we just big... pretend as it is for the, for the purpose of this bit? Then we can so, go certainly, further into Certainly what Matthew said and described uh, is... What, what I would regard as pretty conventional. Um, but anyway, um, so it, I, I, it's a neutral factor. Um, the, the problem for the atheist, though, is that, or the, or the challenge, so the problem, that puts it too high, but the, the challenge is that if you are going to construct the universe out of uh, nothing, you have to be sure that you are genuinely constructing it out of nothing. And relying on the laws of physics, quantum foam, whatever else, is not bringing the universe out of nothing. And why now, do we have to bring it out of nothing? Uh, well, let, let, me, let me finish. Um, you're then the alternative is to say, well, there is no beginning. There's a sort of like a, some sort of stasis position that means that you don't have any cause the human way in which we would think about things as having cause and effect runs out when you get to the very start of the universe which is fine uh, logically i agree but it sort of goes against the evidence because the evidence that we have most cosmologists accept point to a beginning I and mean, this was why the big bang was such a problem for atheists they didn't want a beginning they wanted this sort of static stasis that had been there for all time. But what the evidence we have is that there, surprisingly, well, there is a beginning. And so that is why I personally believe that the Big Bang, the start of everything, is more consistent with something external giving rise to these things. And then I, th there's no problem with cause and effect because I've identified the cause. Well, for one, cosmologists don't think beginning is the beginning from nothing. They just view it as the beginning of our universe. And they view that beginning from our universe in most uh, models from a quantum foam. But, so the, but where does the quantum foam come from? Why does it have to come from anywhere? Exactly. So therefore, you're saying there's no beginning. Well, if we're to take relatively seriously, then no, there is no beginning. There is a first point in time, which is the Big Bang, but there is no beginning. I disagree with you that most well, cosmologists don't think there was a beginning. I mean, the, the, there's all sorts of debate about what the beginning looks like. Right, and when they're saying the beginning, hallmarks. they're saying the first point in time. They're not saying from nothing. Yeah, but it has all the hallmarks of the beginning. If you talk to the man on the street... About, I don't care about the man on the street. They're not experts in the field. Well, I, I, well this stuff is so much so susceptible to sort of firmatory bias and... All these sort of very human things. Well, you laugh, but... Um, well, yes, because you're, pre you're presenting a god. I mean, and you want to talk about... Well, you tell me, Darren, and where's the... You, you constantly sort of scoff and say, well, the burden's on me, but you haven't given me a single reason why... The if you are the saying thing. that a god exists, then yes, the burden is on you. So why is it on me? Because you're making the positive claim that a God exists. It's, no, not, my, it's not my job to prove you wrong. It's your job well, to prove that you, your claims are correct. Why is it inherently more probable that there's no God than there is a God? Why? And don't just assert because the burden's on you, because you're just asserting the conclusion to make your premise. Well, I'm not asserting anything. I'm recognizing the fact that if I ask you what is the probability of a God existing, you won't have an answer. And so I'll prove that right now. What is the probability of a God existing and creating the universe? It's an imponderable. Exactly. So I'm not just disserting it. Anyone you ask is not going to have that information. So to say that God is more probable when you don't have a probability for God is logically incoherent. No, I think we're across both of us. The whole debate that we had was where does the burden of proof lie? And I said, and I think you accept that in order to claim that the burden of proof favours your side of the argument, you have to point to something in the inherent probabilities 
that mean that in the absence of any evidence, the default position is suit your thesis. No, I never said that. So the default position the is we point? don't know whether it ex uh, God exists or it doesn't exist. So if you're going to say no God exists, you have the burden of proof to prove that no God exists. If you're going to say a God exists, then you have the burden of proof of, of uh, proving that God exists. Well, then we're very close. I mean, I would just I would put it slightly differently, but I think we're saying the same thing that these that it's a binary choice that there's it's imponderable. Uh, that is to say that each individual. No, there's not a mathematical proof that is going to win the consensus of all right you trying thinking to, people. Then why are you trying to claim probabilities then, if there's no mathematical consensus? No, I'm saying that, no, you, you've misunderstood me. I'm saying there isn't, is not an inherent probability. Well, then why are you bringing up probabilistic arguments? No, so I'm saying that isn't an inherent probability. I'm I understand that you're saying that, but, but you say that and then you bring up probabilistic arguments at the same time. I'm asking, how do you square that circle? I don't think I have. I mean, I, 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 I'm not, what probabilistic argument have I brought up? Well, you're saying a God is more probable than the natural reason for the universe. That's a probabilistic argument. My pers that's my personal view, but I can't prove that mathematically to you. If I could, it would be <laughs> an easy debate. Right, and... <laughs> but we can we can prove a quantum foam de uh, from the deductions of the math we know exists. So if you can't prove anything about a god, and we can we have proofs for a quantum foam, then doesn't that make the quantum foam mo more likely than a god? No, because you 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 you're just shifting the the regression one step further. Can I um, can I make a positive suggestion here? Is it possible that quantum foam and god are the same thing? Is that something you could accept, Darren? Uh, if you mean quantum foam is, as a non-intelligent being and you want to call it God, I suppose so, but I'm pretty sure no Christian would accept that definition. Let me make a couple of concessions that you, you might like. Firstly, I do accept that if I'm going to advance the Christian God, I do accept the burden lies upon me because that's just one possible view. I can't say that it's either the Christian God or no God. I mean, there are all sorts of possibilities. So I do agree if you're going to advance a specific worldview, a specific faith or religious view that you've got the burden. So in terms of a, the Christian God, I accept the burdens on me. The second concession, I just want to be clear, I'm using the term God, but I don't mean that to be restricted to the Christian God or a theistic view of God. I'm referring to an external cause, something that lies outside of the natural, our natural understanding of the laws of physics and the like. So, yeah, I just want to clarify that. The point I'm saying about the philosophical binary choice is, I think, well made. It, it's about, is there a purely naturalistic explanation for what we experience, what we see around us? Or do we need something external in order to explain it? that lies beyond and, the science and the universe. And that I do see as like a, an A or B choice, and there's no inherent probability in either one being correct. So if I can just boil that down to in the simplest way I can possibly imagine, the distinction that you make then is, is the universe intended or is it not intended? Yeah, I, I'd probably push back at the word intended because that carries with it baggage, I think, um, okay. in relation to... but. Uh, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that in the regression, if you're going to adopt a purely uh, atheistic worldview, you get to a point where you say, well, there's something beyond the what before, what before, what before, what cause, what cause. You get to a point where you say, I don't know. It isn't God. It isn't an external cause or the the theist says the God in inverted commas, that is the external cause, the uncaused cause. Well, and modern physicists would just cause the, call the quantum foam the uncaused cause. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I mean, you might want to look at the talk from Ard Louis, who's no fool in these areas, but, I mean, you know, he points out that you've still got to explain the laws of physics. And Paul Davis, well, who's not a, God a theist... Doesn't, does, a God doesn't explain that, though. Well, no, a God does. A God, a no, it doesn't. Logical. There's no explanatory power from a God just saying God did it. No, exactly. I mean, what does it, no, exactly. what does it mean I to actually explain you. something? 
I agree with you. You're not proving it from the four corners of the rules of physics and mathematics that we understand in this universe. The, the atheist has got the same problem, just a slightly different repackaged problem, because they will never be able to explain the maths and the laws of the physics. They, they can never explain the origin of that because you, you've got the problem of infinite regression. And why are we assuming there's an origin? You keep asserting that there's this an origin, well, but you scientific... haven't demonstrated there is one. The whole scientific endeavor is concerned with explaining things, why they're there. Well, even yes, if the explanation point, you... is it's always been there, even if you've got to go for a stasis sort of explanation, you're still giving an explanation. Well, what if I just take the normal theist way out and saying, and just say that the quantum foam is necessary? That, that's not the theist's explanation. God, well, God it is usually is for necessary. God. That's why well, they say God is uncaused, is because it's, he's necessary. No, I mean, you see, this is a mistake that many atheists make. They see the, the reason for a theistic worldview as being driven by the need to find a creator. And I mean, that's plainly not right. I mean, it doesn't fit a huge number of world religions who have a pantheistic approach. That, well, that is driven, that's driven at a, the Christian well, three world religions that have a theistic approach, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But, I mean, that's not theism. I mean, that's just one part of theism. The reason I think that mankind reaches out for something beyond himself has more to do with the fact that man is a moral animal and you need something external in order to rationalize morals. As, Can you uh, demonstrate that's actually true or is that just an assertion? Well, Hume, I mean, it's conventional moral philosophy for hundreds of years. Hume uh, reasoned you can't get aught from ears. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's pretty well accepted, that it's impossible to derive moral qualities from is statements. Um, right, but we don't. We, we uh, get moral uh, proclamations from the environment around us and how we would like that environment to appear. Part of my law degree involved looking at some of this stuff, but there's a writer called Kelsin who points out, builds on Hume's work that you can't get aught from is, and what he reasons is that all ought statements have to be derived from another ought statement, and then you reach a logical point at which the grand norm, all normative statements derived from another norm, and then you reach one central norm, one central ought statement, and you just can't go behind it. So I can't sure. remember what you just said, Darren. You said morals are de derived from something about the environment. Right. We have goals that we want to achieve, and then we have our current state, and the odds are what get us from our current state to the goals we want to achieve. The whole is-odds thing is largely a red herring. Well, I'm not sure it is. You, as a clear atheist, would agree with the fact that there is no good, no evil, we live in a moral vacuum. There's no such thing as morals other than the construct that human beings have made for themselves. Right, but the construct doesn't mean that morals don't exist. They do exist as that construct. So to say that I don't believe in good or evil is only true if you believe that uh, God's dictates are good and evil. So obviously I don't believe in a God, so I don't believe in that good and evil. But I still use the words because there are still morals that exist even if they're just constructs of humanity. Yeah, so you would say there's no objective morality, but there's subjective morality. Um, I say that because no Christian has ever demonstrated anything objective about morals. Um, there's nothing that they can point at and say, this is the objective moral. They can just assert that their God said so, so that's the objective morals. I think you can go a lot further than that, because I think for the theist, or the Christian theist, I suppose, at any rate, is that morality is a non-material aspects of the universe and so therefore there are it's got created i accept right but, but no no theist has ever been able to demonstrate that the non-material is a real thing of course you can't of course you can't well i then please how do you demonstrate that the non-material is a real thing you can't of course you can't if i okay. could it, this would be a very easy <laughs> very easy <laughs> conversation wouldn't it i'd say look here's the right. proof <laughs> right, but so it, when I say that uh, no theist has ever presented any uh, evidence that the non-material is a real thing, so how am I supposed to believe the theists about what they are claiming that non-material is, what it can do, how it interacts with the real world when they can't even demonstrate it's a real thing? You can't prove it. 
I ask myself, and I have asked myself in the past, you know, that the, there have been times I've really questioned all this stuff quite deeply, is for me, does the universe, the world in which I live, make sense when seen through the eyes of an atheist? And I quoted the famous quote from Richard Dawkins in his um, River Out of Eden, um, in a universe of electrons, selfish genes, blind physical forces, genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, some people are going to get lucky, you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe is precisely the properties we expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Now that, that's an accurate, intellectually honest depiction of atheism. So I've got that worldview and then I've got a worldview which has concepts such as good and um, free will, good, evil, art, beauty, all these other things. And I have to my, ask myself, well, do I find it more plausible that all these things have re no objective meaning whatsoever? So I commit the most heinous crime, murder a child or something like that. That is simply a reflection of my genes and the law, the physical laws of the universe operating on my atoms in my brain, they don't have any choice about it. It's just an extrapolation of some physical forces. Or is there something wrong about that? Something bad, something evil about that? And that's a personal view, but I find the latter more plausible. Now, you can perfectly point out, and you'd be right to point out, the fact you find it plausible is simply just a further layer of a construct that your brain is telling you it makes sense and you can't trust your brain in that sense. And, that, and that's perfectly rational. I'm just, but I have the choice, don't I? I'm the decision maker in this. And I do think that a world without justice and suffering, right and wrong, free will, all these things, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Right. But under an atheistic viewpoint, you're not lacking all of that. I mean, you're asserting that well, under am, an because I'm, you're I'm asserting that under a naturalistic view that you're lacking all that. But actually, talking to a person that has that view, I'm not lacking all of that. Right. So your uh, initial premise is just factually wrong. Do you um you know Richard Dawkins? I think in Blind Watchmakers where he develops this, but yeah, the, he also enjoys art and beauty and everything else. You know, he has this view of humanity that we are just really our genes and the phenotype is simply something we've built around the gene to propagate the gene so the, yeah. the mind the brain the body i i don't know if you you would subscribe yeah. to that it's a, it's a logic well yes and he also believes in beauty and art and justice and right and wrong he but doesn't no, lack any of those there's no reality to it is there well yes That's, there is no there isn't that's what he's there, the phenotype there's the no objectivity, brain, but that doesn't mean there's no reality to it. The brain, which is simply as the bird builds the nest, so the gene has built the brain. The brain saying and expressing and maybe even persuading itself that there is such a thing as beauty and art and right and wrong. There's no reality to that. It's simply yes, part there is. of the way the gene, it's simply part of the way the gene will propagate its 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 replication and survival. Yes, can you, the, can the I, can I just jump in there? The world, Sorry, Darren. Is the beauty. I, I just had to jump in on it. What, what do you mean, Paul, by the phrase, um, there's no reality in that? Because no for me, reality, reality is... There's no objective reality to it. It's all subjective. And what would objective beauty look like? A lot of things I find beautiful. I don't think that... The point, well, you're, though, saying, you're saying it's subjective. Is, so what does objective beauty look like? Is what it is something it? we can touch? The DNA is it something we can measure? It's beautiful. Well, yes, but that's a subjective no, we're not, claim we're not about the about world around you. It's beautiful. We're talking about is there such a thing? Right. It, right. Our brains interacting with the world is what most people call beauty. I mean, let me so, ask you this, Darren. Do you think that there's such a thing as free will? Well, no, I'm a determinist. I, uh, as far as I can tell you, things are you're either determined to do what you're doing or you're not determined to do what you're doing and if you're not determined as far as i can tell that means random and neither random nor determinism gets you to free will as far as i can well, tell well i think you must be right about that on the, on atheistic view that that, that must be right the, well, under the atheistic atom, view that's right too on what sorry? on a theistic view that's right too no, not if there's a spiritual aspect to the whole well because the spirit's either going to be determined or random neither way gets you to uh, free will 
Well, I, I disagree with you. I think that moral accountability concepts such as justice and evil and good. And okay, so sorts, how do you get to free will then? Free will. That there's a spiritual part to mankind. All right, and what does adding a spiritual part add? Uh, how does that get you to free will? Well, because it means that the things that I do are not simply the product of the atoms in my brain obeying the laws of physics. Right, but they're obeying some sort of laws, right? No, I think that there's a spiritual aspect to this. It's a non right, but the spirit, aspect to the universe. The spirit has to follow some sort of laws, right? I it's, mean, there's going to be some sort of laws that describe how the spirit works, well, right? I mean, the, the, theologically, no, because theologically, the whole point of free will, man has choice. So the spirit is completely random? On the contrary, there is free choice. Well, I'm asking what the laws of the spirit are, because you're saying that the laws of the physical world prevent us from having free will. So you're saying that the spirit has no laws that keep it together? I mean, what is what is this spirit made out of? How does it work? What does it do? I mean, how do we determine that any of this is like non real stuff? Non-material. It's a non-material aspect of the universe. Okay, to, what to, does that to, mean to, to be a non-material aspect of the universe? Well, just what I've just said. It's It's something that lies outside of the atoms and electrons that make up okay, the, human, so what, the human frame. So what is it made out of then? There's an, there not, is an uh, electrons and atom. I mean, what do you want, Darren? I mean, you, you, well, you, you're, 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 you're making you're, claims about how the world, the universe works as if you know how they work. I'm asking, how does it work? I, I don't know what the substance is of the spirit of a man or the non-material aspects of the universe. I think that they are not susceptible to scientific inquiry or mathematical construct. Okay, so how does the spirit prevent the physical world from determining our decisions? How does that work? How does the, how does the a man's spirit and free will cause them to make a, a decision? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Well, you're saying that it does, though, as if you know this I is how the What world I'm works. saying is that these concepts, to me, I think have reality. Right, if but, you, um, if but you, I mean, like, if we're talking about evidence, which you defined as facts of reality, then if you're going to be believe something, shouldn't you at least know how it works first? The point about evidence is that one decides what one adduces, what one has as part of the admissible body of evidence that you're going to look at. Now, personally, I think that a universe where there is no free will, no evil, no good, no design, no purpose, nothing but pitiless indifference, no justice, no suffering, all of these things that many, many atheists sort of take for granted as part of their worldview. Many atheists assume that you can rationally deduce these constructs from external reasoning, God, a godless universe, and you simply cannot. And for I me... I have. Uh, well, I don't think you have, Darren, to be honest. I think what you well, do... You I, I mean, I, I have. You, you're saying you, that it's impossible, but I have. So I'm not entirely sure why... Well, all you do is I say, well, I, be I, I believe in good and evil, or I live my life as though there's such a thing as good and evil. Therefore, it exists. But, but, well, because I have preferences, and I understand what makes me feel good and what makes me feel bad. I know the chemicals in my brain that produce those feelings. I know uh, how the outside photons that uh, hit my retinas and cause cause my brain to react in different ways uh, because of the chemicals that are in there. I, I know uh, you how... Don't have free, it, you don't have free will, do you? I, I have a will. I don't have the libertarian free will that theists are usually talking about when they talk about free will. When you do something, you're doing this podcast, right. when you're arguing for the perspective that you want to argue for, all of those things are simply the atoms in your brain obeying the laws of physics, aren't they? Yeah, just like your computer produces uh, simulations of entire worlds just with yeah. the atoms that are inside it. You're a sophisticated computer. Well, I don't subscribe to that worldview. Well, that's fine. Can I jump in here on the, on the free the will thing? Because um, we've, we've touched on that a, a couple of... Oh, sorry, you guys have touched on that a couple of times. It's fascinating here listening to you guys go on. But... I'd like to challenge you directly, Darren, on on the free will thing. And you know already that that I share your view on free will. But I would also acknowledge that it feels like I have free will, regardless of what I believe about free will. It feels like my my will is free. 
do you accept that we behave quite often as though we actually do have free will and we ignore the fact that we are determined a lot of the time? Is that not good enough to think that we might be wrong about what we think about free will and Paul is actually right? He's just more advanced than us? I don't see how free will is even logically possible. Um because we Paul, often feel and we often act as though we do have free will, regardless of what we might think about it. Right, but just because we act like we do doesn't mean we actually do. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, what I find with these debates is they, in truth, they expose that a lot of these issues are not scientific issues at all, but philosophical issues. And whether you're talking about the resurrection or the Big Bang or free will or all the, you, you, you just, the final, the end buffer comes with the atheist who says, well, it's, everything is in the natural and it's atoms and electrons and the like. And the theist says, well, I, I that doesn't make sense to me. I, I might not fully be able to explain it or even put my finger on it. But that doesn't make sense. I think there's something more. And that's just the philosophical difference. And you can't resolve it because you're quite right. I totally agree with you, Darren. The fact that I feel as though I have free will doesn't mean I have free will. The fact that I feel as though some things are good and evil doesn't mean that there is any reality to that. The fact that I see something beautiful and have a sense that there's an objective beauty or listen to music or all these things, none of that. It doesn't prove anything because it's all subjective. So I can't establish the objective from my subjective state of mind. But I can ask myself, as the judge in my own cause, where does the evidence lead me? And, and what do I feel more plausible as a worldview? And my own position is that I think it's more plausible as a worldview with these things built in, having objective reality. Well, and the evidence points the opposite direction no it if we, doesn't if we, yes we does the I'll, I'll, I'll explain the evidence depends what evidence you want if you're if well, i agree if you're going to say if you're going to say that i exclude from the evidence my own subjective impressions then i think you're probably right about that then but i well, i choose it, it, not to just, exclude that from the evidence. just give me a moment i can actually explain what the evidence is and why neuroscientists all over the world are like 99% atheists because of what they found because we know that the brain is a chemical machine we know that when we add dopamine to the system we feel happy and when we take it away we feel sad that's how antidepressants work drugs alcohol that's how all that works. That's why we change personalities when we have brain injuries. It's why we can actually watch memories form. And if we take out that memory, it's gone. And if we put it back, that memory all of a sudden turns back. And we know that all that chemistry that happens in our brain works on the laws of physics. Now, what we don't see is because we know for a fact that the brain works on chemicals and electricity, what we don't see is anything adding in any electrical impulses or chemical reactions into the brain from outside. We don't see that, which is what we would expect to see if there's some sort of spirit or something affecting how we make decisions. We don't see that. Christians or anyone presenting a soul has never, ever presented a model for how it's supposed to work. In fact, if we trace back the soul, clear back to the original ideas of it, they were basically saying the soul was equal to life. And it wasn't until Plato and Socrates and some of these others that it became immaterial and existed after death and all this other stuff. So given that when we examine the brain, we find a chemical machine. And when we examine the history of the soul, we understand it's a misunderstanding of what life is. I'm pretty sure that that's enough evidence to suggest that we are our brains, that there's nothing else out there, especially considering we don't see anything else interacting with the brain. There's no chemicals that magically appear. There's no uh, chemicals that magically disappear. I mean, it's all accounted for. You quoted a statistic. Do you mind if I press you on that? I did? Okay, uh, go ahead. You quoted a statistic 99% of neuroscientists are atheists. Can you just tell me what your source is for that? I don't have a specific source for that. The I read a book once from a neuroscientist who was talking about the soul. And 
he had said that no neuroscientist he has ever met believes in the soul. And I figured there's probably at least one or two out there that believe in a soul. So I just bumped that down to 99%, but it's mostly just from... It's your impression. Right. Yeah. I mean, nothing you've said presents to me at least any evidence other than simply what you're saying is that we can observe and make physical uh, rationalizations of things that are the human brain experiences and decision. I don't, I don't doubt that, but you've not really proved to me that there's no such thing as free will. And you certainly not proved to me there's no spiritual element to mankind. There's a saying that, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence and which is true for most things, except there's a qualification to that. When you expect there to be evidence, for example, if you think that someone ate your birthday cake, but there's no evidence of anyone even touching your birthday cake, that's evidence against this idea that someone ate your birthday cake, right? From what we found out, we understand that the brain works on chemistry. That's the language it knows. So if well, you're going to propose... The physical brain, the physical brain, but how, how do you go about excluding... Well, that's what I was just about element. to get to. Sorry, go on. So if you're going to propose a spirit or something else, I mean, there's lots of things in science, be dark matter, that kind of thing, um, that they're just sort of placeholders for things we don't understand. So just having a placeholder for something that we don't understand doesn't make it wrong. The problem is, is that if you're proposing a spirit and that's your label for something you don't understand, that's fine. However, if you're going to say that it interacts with the brain, then it's going to leave footprints. It's going to leave, uh, because we know the brain, the only language brain knows is chemistry. That means that the, the spirit has to talk chemistry and it has to convey that information to the brain somehow. And the only way to convey information to the brain is through chemistry. And so if you don't see anything appearing in the brain that's unaccounted for, that means there's nothing introducing things into the brain. When I asked you about, do you believe in free will, you said that there are two aspects to your decision making. One is a deterministic aspect and one could be a random aspect. I think, I think you said that. I've, as far as I can tell, those are the two logical possibilities. So random means happens without any discernible cause. In most cases, yes. In this case, I'm using it to mean no determinism at all. Yes, all right. That's fine. So how can you possibly exclude a spiritual element to that? Well, the problem is, is that that dichotomy, as far as I can tell, it's a true dichotomy. If anyone's listening to this and they can think of a third way, then please let me know. As far as I can tell, that's a true dichotomy, and it would have to, work, it'd have to apply to the spirit as well. So either the spirit is determined by some sort of laws. And if it's determined by laws, that doesn't get you to free will. And if it's completely random, that also doesn't get you to free will. So I'm not entirely sure how you even get to free will. I can see how you get to will because that's compatible with uh, determinism, having a will, making choices, taking in information, making uh, decisions about that information. All of that is consistent with determinism. The problem is, is that I don't see how you get to a libertarian free will, which is what most I'm assuming that's what you're talking about when you say free will. What I mean is free will. When I say free will, I mean a meaningful choice, i.e. the scope for moral accountability, the scope for um, assessing acts of men as being good or evil. That's what right. I mean. It's sort of like a moral dimension to the universe. So a, 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 a real quality of man's actions. Right. All, all of that's compatible with determinism. No, it isn't, because you can't possibly... How can you be accountable for something that you have no choice? Well, accountability is a human construct. Yes. Yeah. So we can make people accountable. I mean, if... Um, but you're making them accountable on the basis of a fiction. That doesn't change the fact that they're still accountable, because accountable is a human construct. I mean, aren't we both of us interested in the truth not what constructs i mean somebody as you rightly say could believe there are fairies at the bottom of the garden that doesn't mean there are fairies at the bottom of the garden aren't we both concerned to find the truth and mm -hmm. if we're interested in truth as i think we all are 
we don't really care about the construct. We want to know what the actuality is. Somebody says to me, I believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden. Therefore, there are fairies at the bottom of the garden. We would both think that was very bizarre. Right, but the you care about they people murdering people, make right? True. The fact that you, you believe in good and evil doesn't mean there is good and evil. We want to know whether there is good and evil. We want to know whether there is, in truth, a moral dimension to the universe. Do you sure. care if you get murdered? Do I care if I get murdered? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that has a real in the world presence, right? So if you care about if you get murdered and take that out to care whether other people get murdered, which I'm assuming you do, right? No, but that's the problem. You see, you, you can't use a utilitarian basis to establish morals. I, I'm not using I'm not utilitarian. utilitarian. You are because you're saying that care... No, I'm using your murdered. personal preference. Now, you see, there are a number of reasons why I don't want to get murdered, the least of which is the moral quality of the act. The most important and pressing is that I want to survive. Right, so, and that's all you really need, right? <laughs> I'm not really meeting the point. The point is, for the atheist, there is no moral quality to the act. All that you're well, yes, left yes, with... Yes, there is. Well, not objectively. Well, how are you defining objective morals? Something that exists in the universe, something that okay. is susceptible, has an objective meaning. Okay, exists how? Is real. Okay, so we can measure it, we can touch it. No, no, but you're... you're <laughs> I, I'm, I'm generally confused here. I, when, obje when the Christians start saying objective morals, they talk about it as if it has this meaning well, well, I'm dealing that with... everyone should just understand, but I don't I'm... actually understand what you mean by objective morals. The, the sort of this knee jerk, <laughs> what is it, what is it, what is it? That's not the philosophical point I'm making. The philosophical point I'm making is that you can view the universe with moral qualities, or you right, can view the universe what without them. Sorry? And I don't understand yes, what that means when you say, yes, you no, I don't. You, said you subscribe to moral morals. Yes, because you... morals are based off of our pre preference and how our brains are wired. If our so brains were wired differently, our morals would be differently. Subjectively. But it's, okay, you can but call it subjective or objective all you want. As far as I can tell, that's how morals are made. Well, no, because the world of difference between a subjective belief and objective reality. I can okay, so what is the objective reality of morals then? It doesn't then? make it true, does it? Well, right, and so you claiming they're objective morals doesn't make that true. So what? No, I agree. I got, how, how do I do? How you. do I how do I uh, test to recognize the difference between an objective moral and a subjective moral? What is the difference there? Do, do you not? I mean, do you not agree that there are there are t there are two worldviews in this regard? One. Right, we're not talking about worldviews here. Sorry. I'm, I'm not. I'm not asking about worldviews here. I'm asking. If we're actually talking about how the real world is, what does the real world look like with an objective moral versus what the real world looks like with a but subjective moral? Before we, I mean, there's all sorts of answers I could give to that, but before we get there, I just want to get the sort of the fundamentals straight. Okay. The, the view of humanity, the selfish gene, the phenotype bodies built around it, nothing but atoms and electrons, that 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 um, that view of the world, atheistic view of the world, there, there is no room in that construct for morals other than what the genes have created for themselves to, to perpetuate their survival. Is there? Sort of. Uh, it's also uh, social constructs, but I get what you're saying. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to be. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a fan of Richard Dawkins. I mean, I've, I've read not all of his books, but most of his books. I think he, wrote, he writes very well, and he's a very honest atheist. I mean, he says ex exactly like it is. Right, but, and our um, genes produce a, a brain capable of creating concepts and having preferences and that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah I mean, basically, yeah, I generally agree with it. Okay, all right. If it's a little bit so, too simplified for me, but... It's, it's, quite, it's a stark choice. It's simple because it is a simple choice. You either say that that's the worldview, the atheistic, naturalistic worldview, or you have some belief or conviction that there's more to it than that, that there is, in fact, some sort of moral dimension. Now, um, I, 
my personal view is there is a moral dimension. Now, you asked me a question I didn't answer, which is, OK, well, if there are these morals, where, where do they come from? Well, I think there are a number of sources. I think that the, the human conscience is a, a reflection of the moral dimension to the universe and to mankind. As a Christian, obviously, I would say that there are laws uh, that we see in, in, in the Bible that are a, a reliable guide to the moral quality of the universe. So, yeah, I mean, I would say you'd say, well, how do you find them? That's how that's how you find them. Well, um, that's how you claim to be able to find them. But if we're talking about reality and not just what we want to believe is true, then how do we verify that's accurate? You can't. These are, these then, are why, then why are you claiming it exists if you can't verify that your claim is accurate? Because my personal view is, my personal stance is that a worldview which has a moral dimension is more plausible than a worldview without a moral dimension. Let me, let me, let me, personal sort of, um, personal story. Um, I, I was brought up in a uh, Christian home or a church going home. And I suppose until my mid-teens didn't really have any conviction about uh, the truth or otherwise of Christianity. It was, for me, um, pretty much a <laughs> closed book or I wasn't that interested. And I did have a conversion experience at the age of 14 when I uh, found or believed at any rate that I f found the faith. Years later, um, so this is when I'm late 20s, I started to get interested in this, these sorts of deeper questions and ways of looking at things. And I started to read more widely about these sorts of issues. And I read, the first book I read of Richard Dawkins was Blind Watchmaker, and it really, really challenged me. I think it was a really good book. And he writes you know, really well. He's a lucid writer. And it, uh, I, I had to really rethink ev everything I believed, I think, or most things, not everything I believed, but most things I believed. And I came, the one thing I couldn't get over, this part of me almost was attracted to the atheistic view because I'm a reasonably logical person. And I get the whole thing about you know, relying on God just to cheat. You know, you just, it, it's a sort of, if you can't explain something, oh, well, God did it. So, so it's an easy route out. I get all of that. that. There's something in me that that quite appeals to. The one thing I couldn't, I couldn't swallow, I couldn't get over was this problem of morals, free will. And it's not that I can't intellectually get over it, because everything you say, Darren, I totally get that. I, you know, there's no, I don't have any problem that, but there's something more fundamental within me. Now, it may be just that this is me as my construct and my, <laughs> my sort of brain, my genes have told my brain that, you, you know, you've got to think this way. But I've got to be honest about it, haven't I? I've got, I've, I'm, I am the judge in my own cause. I have to weigh the evidence. I decide what evidence is admissible and what's inadmissible. And I admit into the body of evidence these sorts of questions, these moral questions. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying I can prove it. And I'm not saying that there's anything I will ever say that will convince you. I don't, I don't think there is. I'm just saying personally that's where I come out at. But you understand that when you start making claims about how the universe works, that there's objective morals, that there's a spirit that gives us free will, and all of the evidence that we have points against that, you no, understand no, why your claims about it being plausible are a little bit dubious but, but to this is my, right? This is my quarrel with, with, I mean, this is one of the reasons I said with is assertions are made like that, which when you drill down into them, just do not stack up. Well, except what I asked you evidence? what the evidence was for a spirit, and you couldn't give me any. I asked you what the evidence was for objective morals, and you couldn't give me any. So, I mean, I'm, I, it's not like I'm just asserting this. I'm actually interacting with you well, and evidence, finding that you're not presenting anything. The, ev the evidence I have is that I, I have a choice, a binary choice. Right, but that's not but evidence according to your definition. Just let me finish. Let me finish. When I view an atrocity, so the Holocaust, or... 
um, that uh, you, you probably won't know, but when I was reading Blind Watchmaker, it wasn't long after the Dunblane massacre where somebody with a gun walked into a primary school and shot a load of children. When I see atrocities like that, I find it impossible to reconcile my reaction to them with an atheistic view of the world, a Richard Dawkins view. I cannot do it. That's the point. Now, it, it is not unfair for you to say that I am giving too much weight to my subjective impressions. That is a perfectly plausible thing. And it's perfectly plausible for you to say that I am wrong to admit those feelings into evidence. I'm just telling you that's the way I see it. I mean, I, I find it no, implausible. I find it implausible that in a universe which has so much in the way of patterns and apparent logic and uh, it makes sense, it's comprehensible, I find it inconceivable. Personally, this is my own personal view, that that is all just random. When I look at the DNA molecule and the beauty, the elegance with the way it re replicates itself, I just struggle with the idea that that is all just an accident, just a fluke. Yeah, um, Richard when, I look at the, when I look at the fine tuning, no Richard Dawkins accepts. We may never know, he says, we may never know how life began. When I look at the fine tuning argument, and it just so happens that the universe that we inhabit, and it is the only one we know about, for sure. The universe we have it is fine-tuned for life to an incredibly improbable degree. I, I find all of these things start to fit together, and they fit together around a theistic worldview, and they don't fit with an atheistic worldview. Well, they do fit under an atheistic worldview, but the problem is, is that everything you've presented there is not evidence. It's incredulity about what you're seeing, but your incredulity is not evidence because you defined evidence as known facts. It is evidence. And, it is evidence and, if I am if I'm the judge. Right, and but you, I haven't, admit it you haven't, your incredulity isn't a known fact about the universe. It is to me. It, <laughs> well, it doesn't. It doesn't accurately reflect the universe, though. Just because you can't imagine it doesn't I mean am, it's. I, and I, to say that it it doesn't it isn't plausible under an atheistic worldview is just false. I happen to be an atheist. It's perfectly plausible under my worldview. Yeah, I don't know. I agree with you. I didn't start out, uh, and I don't pretend to be able to mathematically prove the theistic worldview. It's not how I come at it. Uh, let me uh, tell you a good friend of mine who some years ago fell away from the Christian faith and was coming around to an atheistic view. The one thing he couldn't get over, which kept him from going down that route, was the idea there's no meaning or purpose to the universe. But that wasn't the point of my story. He said something that I think quite insightful. He says, if you want to believe something, you ask yourself, can I believe? And if you don't want to believe something, you ask yourself, must I believe? And I can't show you, Darren, any evidence that will compel you to believe. Because I don't, I, I think you come at it from a, well, unless you can show me something that means I must believe, I won't believe. And that's fine. Well, no, uh, I don't. And, and to be fair, I'm coming at it from the other direction as well. This is why I mentioned affirmatory bias, I think. Everybody's guilty of it. I don't actually hold that position. If you're going to say that something is objective, I need something objective to look at. If you can't provide that thing that's objective, that you're saying is objective, then I have no reason to, I, it, I have no reason to think that your claims about objectivity are accurate. I mean, well, one of the, one of the things I did mention is this objective is fine tuning. But of course, then what the atheist will say is, well, we're only looking at one in a whole huge number. Well, that, that is one of the problems. One of the other problems to that is that God doesn't require fine-tuning. He can magic any universe he wants and let us live in it. So it so it's actually le less probable because you're talking one in uh, an infinite set rather than on a naturalistic uh, perspective, we can only exist in a fine-tuned universe. So that actually doesn't point to a God. All these laws of physics that just mathematically all work together. I and mean, this is why the early scientists were all theists, because they saw the laws of physics as being the way of sort of decoding the way the whole thing works. They yeah, assumed the, some creative force behind it because it was also logical. Can I right, just jump the, in before we go too far? The key point there down? is that early scientists, not current scientists. Okay. 
Uh, well, the before cal- we go down the physics thing, so I'll, I'll let you guys go on this, but I'm also watching the clock. But I'd just like to pick up on something that was being talked about previously. Now, I was fascinated by the talk about both of you finding different things convincing. And, and Paul, you've, you mentioned a couple of experiences and, you, and other things that you, you notice and you, you find those convincing for you to consider that there's a God and, and, and Darren, you don't find them convincing at all. So the question to both of you really is if we as humans, uh, as uh, bags of uh, molecules, find different things differently convincing, I'm probably explaining myself badly there, if the same thing convinces us differently or in different directions, is that evidence for or against there being some kind of uh, objective lawgiver? Have I explained myself well enough? Uh, if I were to... Sorry, go on, you go, Darren. I, I'm just okay. So, if I were to summarize your question, it would be: Does the fact that we can't agree on what this lawgiver is doing does that maybe? I'm yeah, yeah, kind there. of. It's not even predicates on there being a, a lawgiver. You know, if if I say talk, we're about to go on to fine tuning. So let's say I talk about fine tuning, and one person will find the fine tuning absolutely convincing that there's got to be a god that did it and somebody else yourself and myself will look at that that same argument of fine tuning and the evidence is behind the values of uh, the, the universe and go well that is the nature of the property of the universe there's no requirement for a god is the fact that different people will be convinced in different directions by that same thing is that evidence for or against there being a an objective lawgiver or a god, or whatever you want to call it. I would say that that's evidence against the theist's ability to make their case. I don't know that that's necessarily evidence against an actual okay. creator. My worldview is that these are imponderables. I would invite any fair-minded person to look at the evidence and work out what worldview, theistic or atheistic, fits best with what they observe about the universe and what they experience themselves as, as part of their life. You cannot rationally prove or disprove either worldview. I can accept that. It's certainly a challenge and that's why we have conversations like this and uh, let's in, enjoy the dialogue and, and the challenge and maybe one year there'll be a scientist that wins a Nobel Prize by, by finding that answer but uh, at this moment in time that answer doesn't exist so we can do the best that we can. Letting you guys go back on to fine-tuning and that's going to be the subject of the next uh, episode of Genexis that you're doing which is this coming Monday which is going to be presented if I understand right by Justin Briley of the Unbelievable podcast. Now just to throw it out there my view on the fine-tuning of, of the universe is I don't find that convincing at all of, of there being a god and and you mentioned Paul about how everything really fits together and it, and it works together. M- my response to that from the naturalistic point of view is along the lines of, well, our, own, our universe can only exist when when things work together. Any universe where these laws don't work together is a universe that's going to fail before it's even begun. So the properties of the matter of that universe, they have to work together. There's no other way they can that the universe can exist. So I'm very comfortable with there being a, a natural is that, universe with these things working together. Is that the anthropic argument? I think it's along those kinds of lines, yes. If, if there wasn't fine-tuning, we wouldn't be here to observe it. So then yeah. it's a neutral point, okay. Yeah, it, it's effectively that. The answer to the anthropic principle is that it's misused frequently, I think, by atheists. I love the great example that Douglas Adams gives which is that the puddle believes that the whole yeah. is made for it. Now, that is a very poor example because that's not the anthropic principle at all. The puddle's mistake lies in not appreciating cause and effect. It, it was explained to the puddle that the whole was there first. It was explained about precipitation from the sky and how the viscosity of water works. Um, and the the rain has come down, the puddle would then be disabused of its misconceptions. Nothing to do with the anthropic principle. It's to do with cause and effect and inherent probabilities. Um, I like the philosophical example that's given of the the man facing the firing squad, Um, 50 uh, guns trained on him, and they all miss. Now, somebody might say, well, of course, 
the anthropic principle tells us that if you hadn't missed, you wouldn't be here to wonder about it. But that's not a very intellectually satisfying answer, is it? One wants to know why. Did they miss accidentally? Did they turn away? Unless you can show that the anthropic principle only works if you can resort to huge probable opportunities. So if, for example, you could show that the chances of all 50 executioners missing was one in, I don't know what it would be, but let's say it's one in 10 billion. And if you could show that throughout the world this was happening in huge numbers such that over a fairly short period of time billions of people will have had been executed by 50 firing squads of 50. then you can deploy the anthropic principle but you need before you can deploy the anthropic principle you've got to have something else and that's why obviously I know you'll say well the multiverse of course comes to the rescue but there you are i mean the multiverse is simply a hypothesis it's not evidence well, it's no less a hypothesis than God is. No, I agree. Look, you, you, you're, you're, you're do, well, lawyers, we call it the Aunt Sally's, where you're, you're, you're setting up. A position. I'm not saying I can prove to you these things. I'm, I totally accept these are all imponderables. And you have to do your best. You look at the, uh, the evidence, what you regard as evidence, and you try and work out what worldview fits best with, with your instincts. Yeah. And in that sense, your worldview is as valid as mine. I don't really like the anthropic principle, although it does sort of answer the question, the incredulity that comes along with the question. But I think the main problem with the fine-tuning argument is, one, God doesn't actually have to fine-tune the universe. Like I mentioned earlier, he could magic pretty much anything into existence and we could live in it. Two, um, it's, it's the universe really isn't fine-tuned for life. It's, if anything, it's fine-tuned for black holes, if nothing else. And I think that the probability that people give for it is just bad math because they never provide a coherent model of the universe when they start figuring out the probabilities. For example, if you take string theory seriously, then our universe has a one in 500 chance of existing. But because the uh, string theory directly entails a multiverse, the probabilities of getting our fine-tuned universe is 100%. Not only is it 100% that we get our fine-tuned universe as we see it, it's 100% that there'll be an infinite number of us exactly doing what we are doing right now exactly and that's just from string theory if you t if you like loop quantum physics better then the probability of us getting our exact universe is one because there is no possibilities to change it if you like many worlds then you're again in a position where you're getting a infinite number of us as doing what we're doing right now. Victor Stenger took a look at the um, numbers used on these arguments. And if you go ahead and intertwine the calculations because they're dependent on each other properly, then he comes up with a one in four chance of getting our universe. So that's my biggest problem with the fine tuning argument is that the probabilities that they put out are usually just bad math. They're making assumptions that they can't demonstrate are accurate some of those points are philosophical the first god doesn't need fine tuning sort of begs the question of what sort of god we're talking about if there's a god it's reasonable to believe he's a god who likes rules he likes doing things in a logical and ordered sense because the Maybe. universe well, that's pure speculation though right it it's a, it's a reasonable inference because if if the universe was made by a god since the universe tends to operate on logical, mathematical laws, it's reasonable to assume that the God who made it intended that to be the case. You must accept well, that as an inference. Well, not really, because you're inferring on an uh, example size of one. If God created this universe with all its laws and rules and logic, it's surely reasonable to infer that the God would prefer to create a universe in that way. It's not because you don't know how many universes the God created. Well, that's that's the sort of another the, the multiverse coming back, isn't it? The only universe we've got evidence of is this universe. Right, a sample size of one. Yeah. So if there's a godlike lawgiver, lawmaker, who creates the only universe that we can observe, 
and it happens to be well ordered and logical, it's, I would have thought, a fair inference that that's because that God decided it would be the case. Would you yeah, accept I don't that? See, I don't see how you get there. Hang on because you, you don't accept that last inference? No, because you're, you're using a sample size of one. Sorry, you don't know how many... Uh, examination. Let, let me ask you again, Darren. If, if the universe, this universe, was created by God, is it not fair to infer that the reason this universe is the way it is is because the God that created it wanted it to be that way. How many universes has this God created? No, that's a yes or no question. Is it not reasonable to infer? I've just put the... Well, asked and answered then. I've just made two... Well, I would have thought the answer has to be yes. It's no, just... because cause you haven't given us any reason to think that... Uh, why? How is this the um, just, universe, the, the, the rule question. and not the exception? I've just fed the conclusion is the premise. Let just listen. Just uh, if if God created the universe, this mm -hmm. universe that we observe, mm -hmm. if is it not fair to infer that the reason the universe is the way it is is because God wanted it that way? No. You won't accept that as an inference. I'm okay saying yes to that. <laughs> That's obviously true. I've just said the same thing in two different ways. I've just fed in the conclusion from the premise. No, because if if the universe was created by God, is it not fair to ensue, uh, infer that the reason the universe is the way it is is because God intended it to be that way? Why is that not obvious? Well, because the Bible, for one thing, says that it isn't the way that he intended it to be. Bible, I'm putting to you a very simple point of logic. If right, but... God created the universe... The Bible it's presents God a God that created the universe that turned out different than the way he intended it to make. So, no, that is not a good inference to make. You cannot infer from the, if the If God created the universe, you're, you're not prepared to infer that the universe was created by God. The I mean, Bible presents a story of a God that created no, it's nothing to do with the Bible. and didn't do it, and it didn't turn out the way God. he intended it to. It's to do with logic. If God, <laughs> do you accept this? If God created the universe... Then God created the universe. Do you accept that? Sure. So if you create something, surely the inference in, the, in just the use of the English language is that the person, the creator, is responsible for the thing created. Would you accept that? Sure. And if they're responsible for it, it means that the thing created, its attributes and characteristics will be attributable to the creator. Sure. Well, then, that, then you just accepted what I said at the outset. No, because you added intent on there. You hadn't gotten to the next step. Did the universe that the God created, was that what his intent was? And you the can't infer that by what was created. Because I can create a lasagna, but if it comes out a black brick, that's definitely not what I intended, even though I was directly responsible for it turning out to be a black brick. Honestly. I mean, that, 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 to my mind, that is just a, a very, very straightforward inference. But anyway, um, you don't accept it. Do you want to clarify for me a little bit, Darren, what the difficulty you've got? It's, it's just around the intent part, is it? You... Yes, it's, it's completely around the intent. Because like the cooking example, just because you intend to produce one result doesn't mean that's actually what you produce. And there's also the Bible. The Bible clearly states that God intended one type of universe, but because we sinned, we ended up with a different type of universe. So the intent is actually important there because you, you can't just assume that this universe was what he intended. But that wasn't... That, that, okay, yeah, I think... Um, sorry, Paul, can I try and uh, clarify? If, see, you know, this will test me to see whether I've understood. Um, I think... Paul is just talking about the, the physics of the universe rather than the post-garden of Eden and what happened on this world in humanity. Right, but those are examples of how you can get something different than what you intend. I was just simply uh, okay. pushing back at your first proposition that God doesn't need a universe that's fine-tuned. But if we're talking about a God that quite likes laws that are logical and work together... Right, but you're in, assuming intent the there. He does... If we're talking about a God that quite likes logic and likes to do things that work mathematically, if we're talking about that sort of God, then he does need a universe that's fine-tuned, or at least he wants a universe that's fine-tuned. Maybe. You don't accept that's a fair inference? 
you're talking about an intent of a being you can't even demonstrate is even real. It's sort of like me saying, well, yeah, if, if string theory is true, then we would expect to see what exactly we want. Well, sure, if you were intending a competent God that intended a reasonable law-giving universe, then that's what we would find. Okay, maybe. But it's a that, philosophical but, debate. You can ask, you can put your hypotheticals where you want. And that's well, yes, that. but I can also hy hypothesize uh, universe creating pixies. I don't know that that's necessarily relevant to what point. we actually see. No one's talking about universe creating pixies. We're talking about whether the fact that you, your point, God doesn't need a universe that's fine tuned. And I'm just making, I would have thought, fair, perfectly fair philosophical argument. Right, but I'm I, I was I'm not in I'm not introducing intent into that. I'm saying that he's physic according to the mythology, he is physically capable of creating any type of universe and putting life in there. Yeah, and that but, has nothing to do with his intent. But but based on the evidence we have about this universe, it rather Sample suggests size of one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hundred right. percent one. And if the God created a billion universes and none of them are like this one, then any inferences you're making about this sample size of one is completely useless, right? Do you think it's – if there is a God, Darren, if there is, is it fair to infer he's, he's – it, he, she, whatever, is rational? No. That's not that, – that, even that isn't a fair inference. You have no evidence of a rational God. No, but it's a philosophical debate. So you're, you're sort of saying, well, because – we are rational. So what facts are you inferring from to get this rational God? Well, it's surely more likely than not that, he, that the God is rational because he's created a rational universe. How is, okay, how are, are you, how are you determining likelihood when you haven't even determined the facts that you're inferring on yet? Fair inference. It's just from, from, from just logic. It's just a That's fair not inference. logic, that's supposition. Would you, if there's a God, if there's a God that created the universe, is it a fair inference that he understands how the laws of physics work? No. Even though he created them? I can create a lasagna. That doesn't mean I understand how all the heat and physics work. But I think, Darren, the point here... But Darren, you won't six. accept anything. If I asked you... Well, I will I not said, accept any speculation God, on intention. Of October, you say no. You, you're just like one of these witnesses who just will not accept anything. If you're you're implying you're you're making supposition you're making inferences on suppositions that you can't demonstrate are even accurate. I, no, I'm not. I'm putting to you. <laughs> yes, you are. You're, you're assuming you're assuming the supernatural. You're assuming uh, a god. You're assuming that that's even capable of creating uh, something. You're assuming that it has to be rational. You're no, assuming I'm not that assuming. he has an I'm intent of if. creating the universe that we exist in. No. No, I'm not. I'm saying if. It's a hypothetical question. You're allowed to right, do Right, and that hypothetical is assuming all of these different things. No, it's not. No, that's exactly what... It, a hypothetical says, if this is the case, would you accept... If A is the case, if A is true, is B true? It's not assuming A is true. On the contrary, it's saying if it's true. It may not be true. But so if it is true, what about B? I mean, I... I, when I listened to the um, the one on the resurrection, you were asked, if there is an omnipotent God, does it not make the resurrection more likely? And you wouldn't even accept that. I mean, I just that was one well with, yeah, well with Andrew and myself. I don't think Dar Darren wasn't. Uh, oh, wasn't on it? That, oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I've, I've done you a misservice. But there has to be some sort of like, if this, just if, if you want to make this if statement work, let me show you how to do it. If the supernatural exists, and if God exists, and if um, God is capable of actually producing physical things, and if God has the intention of creating the uh, universe as we see it, and if uh, he is competent enough to actually pull it off, then you can get to your inference that this universe was created by a God. But that's an lot, awful lot of ifs that we're making there. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think... I don't think most people would struggle with these sort of debates. But anyway, never mind. Can I quickly come back on the other points? Um, so point number one is that it's a fair inference that if there's a God, 
God is rational and would, would quite like the universe to work according to rational laws. Secondly, not fine-tuned for life. I'm not sure <laughs> so long ago, I'm not sure I remember exactly what that point was. The last point I think is a very interesting one, actually, because the, the challenging the maths, um, I do sense that there's there's scope for debate about that. Uh, certainly it's true to say that the calculations have moved. You know, I am influenced by the fact that non-theistic cosmologists re- regard the universe as having been fine-tuned. People like Paul Davis, I mean, Fred Hoyle back in the day. And Paul Davis is, it would be appalled to think that he's being cited as, a, a, as somebody's views support theism because he absolutely is not a theist. But he regards, and he, I mean, he's going to speak hopefully at next year's uh, Genexus again if we can get him in. But he's going to speak about the arrow of time and about how that is a, a, a remarkable pointer to the fine tuning of the universe. So, yes, I accept there's probably scope for controversy, but I am influenced by the fact that people who have no skin in the game who are entirely neutral, regard the universe as fine-tuned for life. I think my uh, my challenge there would be, it could well be that theists and non-theists are possibly meaning something slightly different by fine-tuning. You may be right. I mean, the other thing, I mean, we, we may not have time, but I, I sense as well that the, world, the word multiverse is used in different contexts by, di- you know, different people with different understandings of what that actually is. But Yeah, it anyway. depends on the model being used. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> might be beyond the scope of this. Yeah, there was. I also wanted to ask you, Paul, because you mentioned in your presentation that you had difficulty with uh, Russell's teapot. If you're able to sketch that out very quickly in a minute or or so, and I'll promise to hold Darren back, and we won't challenge back on that. No, no, no. Otherwise, uh, we'll save it and uh, we'll we'll cut. I I, th- I think we've already covered it, to be honest. Because okay. I, my I accept that if I'm going to posit a microscopic teapot um, revolving the sun between Earth and Mars, I accept the burdens on me to establish that. And I accept that any thesis that is particular in that regard, so I would accept that if I want to prove the Christian God or the Bible or anything, I accept the burdens on me. I accept the default in that is a zero belief. I don't think that analysis works for the binary choice between a theistic worldview and an atheistic worldview, because that, I think, you have to choose one of them, and neither can claim inherent probability. They, they both just depend on a sort of philosophical heads or tails, what's your worldview, and I don't think either side can claim that the, the burden of proof favours them. Thank you, Paul. I owe you an apology because I normally make an effort to email this in advance to all Christian guests that we have on. But I like to ask our Christian guests if they have a favourite Bible character and just to, to say who that is and a little bit about them and why that character is, is a favourite. If you've got someone in mind who you want to give us an answer to that question, I'd love to hear it. Well, I'd have to say Peter because he's deeply flawed like me, but sort of manages to find his way in the end and denied Christ when he was up against it. But then, according to Christian tradition, at any rate, was martyred for his faith. So I I do regard him as a bit of a hero. Right. And he's the one who Jesus said, you'll be the rock of my church or something like that. Well, I remember my Bible, right? That's a that's a. That's a, a Roman Catholic reading of that. I, the way I read that is that Jesus is, is saying, I'm going to call you Peter, which means a small stone. And upon this rock, speaking of himself, I'll build my church. So, OK, that's an interesting angle. I don't think I've heard that interpretation of it uh, before, Paul. I, I think I quite like it. Uh, but if actually, a Roman Catholic, I've never been a Catholic. Say, so The Roman Catholic would say, well, that was Jesus so, you know, making Peter the first pope. But I, I don't obviously subscribe to that because I'm a Protestant. OK, thank you for, for that, Paul. And you've managed to keep the tradition of we've had no duplicates on any of the answers yet. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for the last uh, couple of hours of dialogue, Paul. Darren gave you quite a hard ride there. Well, thank I'm not you sure. Com- I, I'm, I'm worried that I gave Darren a harder ride. So I'm sorry, Darren, if I did. Oh, oh no. <laughs> okay. No, if anything, I, sh- I should apologise if I was an ass. No, no, no. No, you weren't. You weren't. You were, it's all fair. And I have to say that I've been really impressed with your 
both both of yours and um yeah, it's just strongly held views but your respect and the way you've you've dealt with me and also from what i can make out the previous podcasts you you are you're both perfectly mannered and i don't object to any of it so well done <laughs> well, and well I, you're a gentleman yeah and i i enjoyed your uh, performance here too i thought you, <laughs> you did well <laughs> Well, I would very much like, I'd very much like to continue this when we can uh, over a beer um, in slightly less sort of formal situation. <laughs> It'll be a longer train journey for Darren, but it's certainly possible for me when, when life is, is normal again. So just to finish up, thank you, Darren, for joining in because you've been appearing, you've been on the Zoom calls with myself on the, the Genexus courses each week. So that's why you've come in here instead of Andrew, because Andrew hasn't been on them. So thank you for that, Darren. Thank you for being my bulldog this evening. Thank you again, Paul, for taking time to, to do this and for the effort that you do in Genexis. It's really appreciated. And just to shout out, you mentioned Ard Louis earlier on in the show. The link to that video to your YouTube channel will be in the show notes. So pop down there to see it and onto your website, which and that will also be in the show notes for all your videos. And until our next episode, thank you and good night. You have been listening to a podcast by Reason Press. To get in touch, email reasonpress at gmail.com or see our website, reasonpress.net, where you'll also find our book, Still Unbelievable. We welcome more feedback and you might even end up on an episode. Our theme music was written for us by Holly. You can hear more of her music at soundcloud.com slash hollybishop. You can support us by buying some of Holly's music and telling her we sent you.